this morning I was reading a report just released by Comscore talking about how just over the last couple years the uh, e-commerce section has grown to be a $10 billion marketplace. Not bad for an economy right now, which uh, really is turning out to be about 14% year-over-year growth. So a lot of that drive in the mobile space and driving e-commerce is coming from um, the mobile itself. And in fact, uh, eMarketer did a recent survey uh, talking about consumers and how we shop and how we uh, pay for services, and 81% of people spend at least an hour researching online before they go and make a purchase. So what that means for us is, is if we have retail stores or us as uh, consumers, we're becoming smarter about what we buy. We're becoming more informed about our options and our choices before we actually go and make purchasing decisions. 79% of the people in the same study actually said that they carry a mobile device with them when they're out and shopping. So now not only are we as consumers becoming smarter about our purchasing decisions, we actually have choices and options and decisions being made right at the time of purchase. So again, for, for retailers, this is changing the way that consumers are starting to shop because now people know what, they op know what their options are, they know what prices are, they've probably done some research around who else has purchased that product, and now they're actually able to um, get that information right there inside of your store, inside your mall, or at the time of purchase, wherever they're at. And 41% of people even said that they purchased a tablet device or an iPad just for the sole purpose of shopping and e-commerce. Kind of an amazing fact that a lot of people are buying this just for a purchasing, uh, for it to be able to go shopping. But what that also means now is people are able to shop no longer just sitting at a computer at home or at work, supposedly during lunch, right? Uh, but they're also now able to shop on the bus, on Max, waiting at the airport. So it's increasing the number of distribution channels people have to use a mobile device to be able to be shopping online. Let's take a little bit about what has happened with our currency. Uh, money hasn't really changed a whole lot over the last several centuries. We started off way back in the early first days really just as a bartering and trading type system. Uh, we didn't really have any standardized value of types of services. I wanted some fish, but I had some corn seed to give. And so we traded. There was no consistency of money or monetary value across territories and countries and regions. And we basically put our own value of what we thought was on top of that uh, currency or the exchange. And then sometime around 600 to 300 BC, the discovery of precious metals uh, created the next evolution of the financial system. And that was really around metallic money. This is the first time where we were able to start putting uh, personalization on different objects, whether it was a lion head or a hole in the middle of the object. But what that did is it started to create kind of the first standardized currency system specific to a particular region. So people now had um, regionalized, standardized money. Uh, they were able to customize it. But the one thing that this was, uh, it was really heavy. And so it was cumbersome to carry around. So then the next evolution came after um, mass distribution of paper. We had paper money. And paper money was pretty cool because now you can carry mass quantities of this in your pocket. And it wasn't so heavy as carrying around gold bullions and uh, all those gold bars and, and so forth. Paper money also started to really create um, a nationwide and global currency system. Uh, we were able to customize it. Uh, for some reason, all the countries liked putting their people's faces on it, so we have a lot of face money. Uh, but it also created different values, and we were able to carry bulk quantities of this around a lot simpler than, than gold. And then really, we didn't go through a lot of transformation until sometime in the 40s. Uh, a prominent businessman was out to dinner and was just closing a very big deal. And he was getting ready to pay for the bill, realized that he didn't have any money in his wallet. And from that experience was the 
birth of the first credit card called Diners. And so Diners was really started off as an IOU uh, transfer paper system. And then what has now evolved to the credit card system that we're familiar with today. Um, in this evolution, the, the credit cards, each credit card company only wanted to have their cards accepted at the merchants. So we went through a lot of evolution where today you can pretty much go and use a Visa, a MasterCard, an American Express, pretty much at any, um, any merchant store. But it, it took some years to get to that point, whereas before it was only just Visa, or I could only just use MasterCard. But credit cards today are even going through a transformation. Visa right now is, is testing out the ability to carry multiple cards all on one credit card. And so what you'll see is a couple of uh, buttons on the back of the card where you enter in one code and now you have your visa with uh, your airline or hotel points and you can use that card. You enter in another PIN code and now you pull up your visa that has cash back. Uh, you can also use this where the credit card number, so they're using this as a security function, where the credit card number isn't visible until you've entered in the PIN code and then it's visible to the merchant to use it in a transaction. And even have uh, two buttons on the, the far left there where you can choose between, if you have a bunch of points built up, you can pay with points or use to pay with a normal Visa transaction function. But really the next evolution that we're starting to hear a lot of buzz and, and interest around and, and even my company adapt to is playing around with and experimenting with is the mobile wallet. And can you make the next transformation of the mobile phone becoming the credit card of the future or the wallet of the future? Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about just what's driving some of this and some of the technologies behind this type of function. So if you look at the future of money, um, again, a, a recent survey done by Google or um, PayPal was showing that 60% uh, of people don't want to have an ATM to go and pay someone with. Trying to, you know, I owe 20 bucks to my friend for going out to dinner or something like that. Uh, it's hard to go and find an ATM when you need it. So being able to do peer-to-peer -peer payments or pay somebody else with a mobile device, 60% of the people said they were, were willing to do that. 56% uh, of the people said that they would be um, never use cash again, or never use a credit card again. So uh, they didn't want to carry cash around. And that's kind of an interesting fact, where people are actually going to more of a cashless society and just using credit or credit cards. 43% uh, said they never wanted to carry cash around with them, and even 38% said that they would be comfortable buying goods and services with a mobile device. And mobile spending globally is on the rise. So while it's not prevalent here in the United States quite yet, it is in some other countries. And this year alone, it's projected to be a $46 billion uh, industry with people spending transactions on there. And we'll talk a little bit about what's driving a lot of these, these online payments. But over the next couple of years, uh, projections are showing that a lot of new um, adoption around mobile and the use of online payments is going to continue rising. So if you look at who some of the most trusted companies are today in the mobile device, um, not too much of a surprise here. The, the major credit cards uh, are considered the most trusted uh, advisors online with mobile payments, Visa, MasterCard, American Express, PayPal. And then you have kind of an interesting one. The U.S. Postal Service. People trust the U.S. Postal Service in on, for online more so than Apple or Microsoft. Uh, and then you have Google. The other interesting component you'll notice here is Motorola. So Motorola is the only mobile carrier to be listed in this survey as one of the most trusted brands so far. A couple of things driving that is there's a technology called Near Field Communications, or NFC, that is only available today on Google phones and predominantly uh, with Motorola. So what Nearfield Communication does is that's the technology that's built into a lot of the credit cards where if you see uh, the credit card stand at the cash register where you can go and tap the credit card and not have to scan it, that's done through Nearfield Communications. And today that's built into a lot of the, the Google phones. Apple does not have near-field communications enabled yet. There's a lot of buzz around this year's release, 
that Apple uh, was going to have near-field communication built into the phone. Um, obviously, they didn't come out with the iPhone 5, which a lot of people were anticipating, but they came out with the iPhone 4S. So if Apple decides to embed near-field communications, look for how these numbers might change over, the, over time. The other interesting piece on here is you have Facebook. And we'll talk a little bit about how Facebook is actually changing the monetary system and the way that we also shop and buy for goods and services. So again, in Europe, near-field near communication and online payments are becoming more readily adopted. Uh, there's a lot of pop-up storefronts taking place. And uh, according to this article, they're saying that that will be the leading uh, method by 2016. And this summer, in the Summer Olympics and in London, uh, look for mobile payments to also be a big driver at the, uh, the London Games as well. So again, if you look at adoption across the different global economies, right now Asia Pacific and EMEA are driving a lot of the mobile uh, payment space. They have been doing this for several years. Well, here in the United States, it's just starting to, uh, to take hold. But what also is, is you look at the adoption curve. And while we're seeing growth across um, all of the major global regions, once the technology has taken hold, look at the difference of adoption between in Asia Pacific alone, just from, from 2009 to 2010. So again, once the adoption curve is going, people are seeming to find it more and more convenient. They're also becoming more and more comfortable as uh, the security functions and so forth get finalized in there. So let's look at pop-up storefronts. This is an actual storefront in a subway station in Asia. And it basically looks exactly like what we might see as a Walgreens or a Rite Aid. But it's a digital storefront that people can go down and uh, use their cell phones. There's barcodes and, and QR codes, and we'll talk about that in the next couple, couple slides as well. But uh, they have those codes right there by the different goods and services. So you can actually go up with your phone, start scanning all the different components, put it into your shopping cart, and pay for it all right there on a, a digital screen in a subway station. So pop-up storefronts are starting to become more and more prevalent. They were uh, being trialed a lot in New York City this summer. And look for more of those across the US to start popping up as well. But going forward, uh, I also look for companies to, to start taking storefronts like this, embed kind of the iPad technology that we're used to, and now you can just start swiping. So eventually you can have entire storefronts all on just a digital screen in a much smaller space. Use your, the swipe feature and just kind of pick the categories, flip through the different pieces, scan your phone, and then uh, actually have it delivered to your house, maybe in some cases before you actually get home. But even in the US, uh, mobile payments is still uh, taking off in certain areas. Uh, anybody have the, the Starbucks app on their phone? OK, a couple, couple folks. So this morning, I uh, put my computer in the office and uh, walked by Starbucks, pulled out my mobile phone. And uh, on it, I have the Starbucks app, which you see right here. And you actually have it linked to the Starbucks reward card. It has actual monetary value on it. And you can then scan it right there at the Starbucks and never have to pay cash for it. So um, again, it's starting to take online mobile payments in an actual form here in the United States. Uh, to date, uh, when Starbucks initially launched this at the beginning of the year, they had over 3 million downloads in the first couple months of loan. So massive adoption on uh, one of the apps here. And it's still considered one of the leaders in mobile payments uh, taking place in the United States so far. So let's look at some of the types of mobile payments that are, are taking place today. Uh, the first one is actually just what we are talking about with uh, the Starbucks app. The mobile wallet uh, actually being on your phone. And this is replacing the credit card, uh, replacing paper money, and being able to take your mobile phone and walk right up to a point of sale at a restaurant, a merchant, uh, a store, and be able to pay for it. Now you have some of the obvious players in this space, such as MasterCard, Visa, American Express, even Discover. And then you have a couple of others that you might not expect. Google, for example. Uh, Google just released what they call Google Wallet over the summer. 
And what they're doing is actually enabling transactions, but partnering with some of the, the cell phone carriers and being able to have a Google Wallet function right there on your phone and go in and transact and actually pay for a service. You have another company on here that probably most people haven't heard of called Isis. And Isis is the cell phone carriers. They didn't want to be left out of the mix as well. So what they've done is a lot of the cell phone providers have formed a separate company called Isis where they'll start to use the mobile payment and the mobile billing as the component. So now the cell phone providers want to be a bank as well and providing transaction services for you. Here's an example of Google and a partnership that they've recently created with Coke and they're enabling mobile vending machines. So again, if you have the Google Wallet app downloaded, you can go up to a uh, Coke-enabled vending machine and actually hold your mobile phone up there, scan for it, and uh, receive their products. Again, look for Coke and Google to have huge presence this summer in the, uh, the London Olympics. And uh, we'll see, be interesting to see how they start really um, growing this service. The next type of, of mobile payment is actually replacing the cash register. So a company called Square, which was formed by uh, one of the former guys that started Twitter, actually wants to replace the cash register. And this actually enables a cell phone or an, a tablet device to become the cash register. So now companies like NCR that have been around for decades and have had cash registry machines are being disrupted by small companies and startups such as Square. Uh, we have other companies like Verifone that are trying to get into this space as well. So you're seeing a lot of adoption within small and medium-sized businesses where maybe the cost of opening a store is becoming cumbersome and I want to buy a huge cash register type system. I'm just going to get a Square device for free, plug it into my iPad, and now I have instantaneously a new cash register right there. The Square device enables the, the iPad to become that cash transaction component. The interesting thing about Square is if companies figure out a way to replace the credit card, Square is either going to have to change its business model to not accept credit cards and accept just a mobile payment, or companies like Square could start up and disappear all very quickly, depending on which direction um, all of this takes place. Another type is, is mobile payments themselves. So again, just the, uh, you know, back in the 40s, if this technology existed, the guy that started the Diners Club card would have been able to just take his cell phone and use bump technology. So if anybody has the um, LinkedIn app on their, their mobile phone, LinkedIn has a, a bump feature where you can actually take your information on LinkedIn and bump it with another person's phone. It's really more just proximity based. But you're able to transfer your, your um, basic business card from your LinkedIn profile over to that person you're bumping with and vice versa. So finance companies are figuring out ways to utilize that technology and start peer-to-peer -peer payments. So sometime in the near future, you'll be able to just bump phones and now when you go out to dinner, no one's trying to like how to split bills three, four, five ways. Everyone just bumps phones and uh, you just make one payment. And you got several companies in here, uh, PayPal, Serve, Douala, that are all starting to mix around into this space. So again, another very disruptive space taking place in the financial sector is around peer-to-peer -peer payments. Direct carrier billing. Uh, basically, you know, put it on my bill type functionality is another big disruptive area. Um, Angry Birds, Farmville, really started creating this whole new concept of in-app purchases. Uh, we start getting push technology on our cell phones. So you've downloaded an app and you're starting to use the app and you want to unlock some new functionality. Uh, you can actually, might have the app for free and then you pay up for certain functions or, or services. And so now you have cell phones using push technology to be able to let you transact and buy that right there on the spot. Um, within Angry Birds and Farmville, people are buying $4.50 tractors and I need seed for crops. Um, again, companies like Facebook have literally created in just the last couple of years a whole new distribution platform 
for how we exchange and use money online. Um, another interesting component here is Facebook is even creating a separate wholly owned subsidiary based out of Idaho, really built around Facebook credits. So even Facebook thinks that there's some big disruptive happenings taking place in mobile and finance and technology. And uh, they've even created a whole separate company around that to start um, building against it. And the final mobile payment area is really just more around kind of what we're calling closed loop or, or in-store pieces. So Starbucks right now is probably the most prevalent example of something like this where uh, the stores are creating their own app and using their own credit card. And in that way, you can use it once you go to their store. Very convenient for stores that you go to a lot. But again, one of the problems here is now if you want to start, if all the merchants start doing this, your mobile phone becomes just as inconvenient as your wallet, where you might have these huge, thick stacks because every company has their own rewards card and their own reward system. So every time we go to Freddy's and every time we go to Target and every time we go to Safeway or Albertsons, everybody has their own cards that they want you to use. Well, with this system, while it is convenient, uh, it also is going to become cumbersome of how do you start managing all of those different apps and so forth. Nordstrom is another local example of a company that's tying in their credit card systems into a, uh, a mobile app. And with, with Nordstrom, you can actually use the camera phone feature. And we'll talk about um, the scanning capabilities in just a second. But they're using the scanning feature to be able to like, zap close, create a wish list, and then uh, make purchases as well. So let's talk about some of the trends that are driving mobile and finance. Uh, and the whole digital wallet space. The first one is uh, barcodes and, and QR codes. Uh, well, barcodes are nothing new. We've all seen them for, in grocery stores and, and merchants for, uh, for years now. What is starting to become more interesting is the use of people using their cell phones. So remember in the earlier uh, part of the presentation, 79% of the people actually carry a cell phone with them at the time of, of purchase and when they're shopping. So now what people are doing is starting to use their cell phones, scan the barcode, and be able to look up where else might I be able to buy this product and who might have it cheaper. So again, if you're a retailer or a merchant um, and you're selling things in a uh, brick and mortar type store, your consumers are becoming more empowered, have more decision making right at the time of purchase, but they can also change their minds and leave very quickly because they're able to get information instantaneously and find out where it's um, going to be cheaper. Uh, even uh, Amazon is creating programs and marketing campaigns around mobile wallet and functionality, whereas they'll pay five or ten dollars for you to, if you scan an item in a competitor store and they have it on Amazon, they'll actually give you Amazon credit to then purchase it through their channel versus purchasing it at the store where you're at right now, scanning it. So even the marketing tactics are starting to change. Lowe's and Home Depot have been doing this for, for years where if you go to one store, they'll match coupons and will beat it any price by 10%. Now that type of marketing tactic is evolving onto the mobile phones itself. QR codes, uh, the funny little boxes you see on the, on the right there. Uh, last year was probably the first year we started really seeing some of these uh, just start to, to pop out. This year they're becoming much more prevalent. We see them in, in magazines, we see them at storefronts, we see them in mailers and, and on flyers. And it's another way to, to be able to provide information and, and store it right there um, online and be able to have consumers become smarter about your product or service. Look for in the future for QR codes to become even more intelligent, where let's say I, I scan it and now it might take me to a video and it shows me the product in motion. Uh, you also start seeing companies such as Apple playing around with, with 3D technology. So I might in the future scan a QR code, hold up, hold up my iPhone and be able to have the image right there and be able to spin it around or at least look at it and then be able to see a video image of that product. So very interesting things happening with mobile technology and how we're shopping and the use of this technology going forward. Geolocation is another way that merchants and mobile are starting to uh, merge together. So companies such as Loop have been partnering with Groupon that 
not only take all the different offers, but now when you get close to a particular store, that offer presents itself. So in the past, a lot of people complained about Groupon because uh, as a guy, I kept getting things for Brazilian waxes. Wasn't relevant to me. What you're able to do is, uh, okay, a couple tweets from that, I'm sure. But, um, but what, what, that, what that's creating is it's allowing companies now to create more personalization. And it's also being able to personalize when I'm close to that store. So it doesn't matter if, I might not be interested in an offer if I'm all the way across town, but if I'm walking past a certain merchant, I might be more prevalent to make that purchasing decision. Foursquare and American Express, two companies you wouldn't really see combining together, be it at uh, this, spring, this past spring in Austin at the South by Southwest conference, those two companies released a uh, interesting trial where you can take your American Express card, um, sync it with Foursquare, and now when you go to certain merchants and you check in, you're able to receive a discount if you use your American Express card. So it's taking a very popular geolocation application, such as Foursquare, and people checking in, and now it's giving some sort of a monetization and a reason to continue checking in by giving me discounts uh, when I do that. And social-based and community-based commerce. Again, uh, on the, the left-hand side is an image of, of people shopping in Europe and how they're able to actually start using their phones, scanning it, uh, but now what they're doing is you're able to go to communities and start seeing who else has purchased this. Uh, what did they have to say about it? You're able to have ratings. You might be able to have offers right there at the time of need when you want it. Sears was even doing something interesting this year where before you make a purchase, they were actually guiding people into the Sears community so that if you had additional questions, they're using community now to actually drive and enhance the purchasing decision. So they know that if people are going to take the chance to scan an item that if I don't end up buying that item, I'm really unlikely I'm going to come back and purchase it because there's too many ways for other merchants to steal my business or entice me to go somewhere else. So Sears is using the community to answer any questions I have, make sure I'm comfortable with the product, and then continue guiding me through the purchasing process. And then we have gamification. So we talked a little bit about, about Foursquare. Uh, there's other companies such as Scavenger. Now, Scavenger is a company that uh, just started over the last year or so, and it really is taking the concept of a scavenger hunt. But it's using geolocation, and it's using the fun piece of games. So now you might have a trivia piece, and then you have to go somewhere and then check in. And then when you check in, you unlock the next clue, and you can move around. And a lot of big brands are starting to uh, use this service to make it fun. Uh, with Coca-Cola, go and find machines um, for Coke and so forth. Uh, car companies are doing this, where you can drive around town and unlock different components of that and then learn about the car itself. So look for continued gamification in these types of areas, but also blending of the other technologies we're talking about, such as barcode scanning, geolocation. On the, the right-hand side is even how corporate enterprises are starting to use gamification. And this is a, a little screen capture of how a company is enticing salespeople and using gamification around that. This was actually built on Salesforce.com. So no longer are a lot of big companies just on the CRM side of things, but they're actually creating products such as Salesforce created Chatter, which they're basically calling it Facebook for business. Um, but here you see that you know, Mark is a salesperson, he's at level 10. They have a, a uh, bar that's showing how much utilization he's done for his sales. He has badges around the things that he's earned or that he's done. And then they also have areas for improvement, elements of coaching, all right in there. So now they're using gamification techniques to even encourage salespeople and businesses. We also have intelligent recommendations. Uh, and look for this to even continue growing. So we have companies like Netflix and Amazon, which will take ratings 
and let you, let you rate movies. And then based on your ratings, they'll make recommendations on other movies that you might like. Based on the movies that you've downloaded in, in the past, they'll make recommendations on other movies that you like as well. Amazon earlier this year allowed you to sync, for, uh, sync, sync uh, Facebook with Amazon. And now you, can on, now you can also see products and services that your friends have purchased that you might like as well. So again, interesting ways here around the implicit pieces of recommendations, people who also bought this uh, similar to you, and as well as collaborative or community-based recommendations. Here's friends of yours that have bought this that you might also as well. A couple of Portland companies that are doing interesting things around mobile. Um, as uh, the announcer had mentioned, we actually adapt to, just launched this morning, our mobile wallet into the iTunes store. Uh, what we've done is taken the aggregation functionality of all of your finances. So instead of having to go around to multiple different websites and track all of your finances, you're able to do that all on the .com site. We also now have a mobile phone, which you can upload all of your different financial accounts and view those. We utilize the camera phone function, so all those different rewards cards uh, for those like myself that travel around a lot, I have uh, rewards points with all the hotels, all the airlines. It gets to be a pain to carry those around. Uh, now I can link all of those into a mobile phone. I even have my Best Buy Reward Zone card linked up in there. So now I can keep track of all my different rewards points and systems. And it helps me track cash flow and see exactly how much money I'm spending. One of the unique things that, that we did is we put some uh, future uh, predictions in there around not only how much you're spending today, but taking a look at recurring bills and expenses that you have, such as uh, mortgage and rent, maybe your car, um, your different bills and utilities. So let's say you might have $500 left to spend, but in actuality, you still have to pay your mortgage and rent, and you still have a car payment. So technically, you're really $500 in the hole right now. And that's some of the unique functions that we built into our mobile app just to help make things a little bit more convenient for folks. What we've done, though, is, is we don't have any of the transaction components. Uh, there still is a lot of movement and volatility taking place in there. So we've purposely held back on any of the transaction pieces, more for a security reason right now, but also just to wait and see how all that space uh, tends to shake out. Another interesting company uh, doing some cool things on mobile and helping enable all of this uh, is Urban Airship. And Urban Airship is doing a lot of neat things around push technology and what they call rich push technology. So push is, if you have a, an application or like an iPhone, all of those red circles, so an app alerting you that something has changed, a new version is there, uh, you'll have that. Urban Airship provides that for uh, a majority of large applications and companies building apps. And then they also are the provider of that will push out that notice. So when we talked about the uh, example of in-app purchases, you're able to hit that button and make that purchase. Um, all, a lot of that technology is driven by Urban Airship. So a couple of quick things to consider uh, how this is starting to affect people is how do your consumers today interact with your brand? Do they shop online? Are they using the mobile phones with your brand at the time of, of purchase? And how might that affect your business? Something else is, is also just looking at, a lot of times the users of the product may not be the purchaser of the product, such as uh, an example might be around nursing homes. Uh, the elderly is the actual user of that product, but a lot of times it's going to be the kids or us that are making those purchasing decisions for our parents as they become older. And you need to start looking at, as you're creating marketing campaigns and programs, how that affects that. How do you treat your customers today? Uh, so if most customers are doing research online and they have a mobile device, how are you rewarding them if they do use Foursquare and check in at your restaurant or at your business? Or they do scan something at your store. Do you even know that your customer is inside your store? Geolocation technology today can tell people when someone is actually within a proximity of your store or business and actually when you're inside of that. And then also, how's this whole thing going to change my 
company? And how's it going to change my brands? So start looking at how people are using to, to pay for goods and services uh, as you're marketing your own brands and your own companies and see how the mobile phone will start looking at changing that experience and how can you improve that experience to make it easier for your consumers. Right? So again, thanks for uh, spending a little bit of time with me. I'm glad to be uh, taking some questions now. Okay, we've had a couple come in. Um, one from the live stream that came in was, are there implications for Bitcom or other global currencies in relation to this mobile space? Yeah, it'll, it'll be interesting to see uh, how different currencies start to, start to really globalize themselves. Um, so for example, right now, there's a lot of uh, segregation still happening on this. So uh, you have the mobile companies themselves that want a piece of this, and that's why they've created ISIS. And an interesting thing is, so ISIS just blocked Google Wallet, or actually Verizon, Verizon just recently announced that they blocked Google Wallet from their phones, because Verizon is part of ISIS. And so Verizon would want you to use their mobile pay payment platform, not the Google Wallet. So while there's potential to have global currencies all around, it still is gonna become really challenging. Um, oddly enough, probably the, the one that has the best chance at doing something like this is maybe Facebook. Because Facebook is widely used across the globe and with Facebook credits is probably considered one of the true first global currencies that can be accepted everywhere. So I had a couple in relation to security. So I'll take this first one and kind of cover them all. Is the concern over security a reason for slower adoption of mobile markets in the Americas? Uh, I think part of it is, is security, and part of it is we've just been slower to adopt mobile technology over time. So if we rewind 5, 10, 15 years ago, uh, the U.S. thought paging was going to be the next big thing. And we spent a lot of time on paging device while Asia and, and Europe went straight into, into mobile. And so it slowed our, our adoption curve for a while and put us a little bit behind. But I think we're also a little bit um, more pragmatic on our purchasing decisions, and we tend to, to question things a lot more. So uh, look for a lot of advancements to be made around security. While uh, people want to have this type of a, of a feature and function, um, we still need to have that sense of security. And I think that mobile payments and security will be more prevalent in smaller purchases, but I think as we get into larger purchases, it will be more difficult for us to really trust a mobile device quite yet to be doing something like that. And especially in an economy such as ours, um, we're creatures of habit. We tend to go back to things that we can touch and feel. So such as in 2008, as the economy was crashing, that's why gold all of a sudden took off because we want to go back to something that we can hold and, and have and, and no one can really take that away from us. Digitally, it still is a little scary for some people because maybe a bank account just gets wiped out. So until we get that, that sense of security around that, um, you know, it will still be an interesting space. There was a great tweet about uh, gold being hard for impulse buys that I saw come through about, you know, it's the, the advent of, uh, of getting to cash and paper as opposed to spending with gold. Mm -hmm. cuts down on yeah, impulse a little, buys. yeah, it's a little hard to roll up to a Starbucks and just drop down a bag of gold coins and try to purchase a couple lattes. But. Um, there's another one about, um, is the Square compatible with PayPal, or do you have to use their merchant processing service? So Square has, a, has a, their own process. Uh, and so basically you can, you can utilize the variety of credit cards and just swipe your credit card on, uh, on the, the Square device. So what, they're, what Square's really trying to do is they're trying to take uh, a piece of that transaction marketplace. So in just um, a year's time or so, Square has grown to process about a billion dollars worth of transactions, um, which is no small chump change by any means. But they wanted to disrupt the, the Visa uh, MasterCard process system, and they also want to disrupt the credit card or the, uh, the cash register system. They want to knock NCR and some of those old dominant companies off the block. Um, I have one here about how does adapt to mobile wallet compare to mint.com? So great question. Um, so things that the Adapt2 mobile wallet does uh, that you won't find anywhere else 
is the fact that um, it aggregates all the financial accounts uh, and bills and utilities that you might find on Mint, but it also aggregates all the rewards points uh, and programs, which you can't do on Mint. The other thing you can't do on Mint is the ability to manually adjust and change your expected income and your expected spending on the mobile phone. And that's what we've built into the adapt to wallet is, let's say, if you know that you're going to have that Christmas bonus come in, uh, you're able to adjust for that. Or for people that work in the uh, industries that you're on tips or commission-based, right? Your income and spending is constantly going to fluctuate. So we created a, a mobile wallet that is more customized. And probably the other truly unique function is the ability to enter future dated transactions or pre-planned expense. So if you know you're going to go and spend $500 for the holidays, you're able to enter that in as a pre-planned expense or uh, purchase that big screen 3D LED TV for the Super Bowl, right? Now you can have a better way to plan for those types of larger expenses coming in the future. All right, well, thank you very much, Mark, everyone. Great, thank you guys.